But I know that I've been forgiven And I'm loved With the greatest love With the greatest love. love Oh, I've been set free I've been Sinner in fact and a righteous and righteous in hope. Now I hate to disagree with somebody as profound and as uh, you know as praised as Martin Luther is, but I do disagree with him. I don't believe I am a sinner and righteous at the same time. When I look to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the central fact of the new covenant experience, I see a death and I see a life. I see a death of one kind of life and a altogether different kind of life in itself. There's no mixture of the two. There's no Adam life, Christ life in me. There's no righteous nature, sinful nature in me. There's no black dog, white dog working in me. This arrangement is not even a continuation of the old life. This is someone brand new, radically new in time and in kind or species. There's no just me living any longer. Just me died. Whatever I was, well, it's just me. No, it's not just you. Just you has been crucified and buried with Christ. You are now Christ in you. There's no changed eye. God is not changing you and me. There's an exchanged eye that has taken place. The eye that was before Christ has been dealt a death blow. A brand new eye has been raised. He's not repairing my life or yours. He has replaced one life with the other. This is when we begin to see, maybe in the light of who God is, who we actually are. This is why Paul would say in Galatians 2.20, you know it well, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's not theology. That is not philosophy. That is not analysis. That is a stun theologian. Paul was not a systematic theologian. He was a stunned theologian. He never got over the fact that God lived in him. That's why he kept referring to it as a mystery. You know what the root word of that word mystery comes from in Greek? This is what it means. Literally, that's what it means. To shut the mouth. We say, well, shut my mouth. When something is really good, just shut my mouth. That's what the word mystery means. <gasps> That's Paul. God's in me. The God who created me has taken up residence in me. Why is that so important? You will never worship God. What doesn't stun you? Listen, I go to churches all over the country that praise worship and worship praise, and most of them are doing neither. It's an exhibition. It's not an edification of the body of Christ because nobody in the room is stunned. You can have all kinds of musicians up there to lead pep rallies for the soul and you can get into it temporarily for a few minutes and never worship your God in spirit and in truth because you will not worship what doesn't awe you. And Paul never got over the fact that God lived in him. That's why he lived the way he did. Everything... Paul says in Colossians 1.19 that pleases God is in Christ, right? It pleased the Father for the fullness of deity to dwell in His Son. So everything that pleases God is in Christ. With me? Whatever is in Christ pleases God. Will you go that far? Whatever is in Christ pleases God. Now where are you? Somebody gasped to the glory of God. Oh! <sighs> Me pleasing to God? You, you didn't see me this week. I don't have to see you this week. We don't judge by appearance or performance. We judge with a righteous judgment. What our Father says is right and true. He says, whatever is in my Son pleases me. You see, it's whoever you believe to be and it's wherever you believe God to be that changes everything about the way you live. 
It's not systematizing your theology, getting into the right church that proclaims the truth. It is who you believe God to be and it is where you believe God to be that changes everything about the way you and I live. Listen, we could get, spend forever talking about the stunning truths of this new covenant arrangement. Let's just boil it down to a couple of them this morning. Stunning truth number one, we have a covenant-making God. We're talking about a God who initiates a relationship with Himself at the very center of our lives. We're talking about an eternal God with an eternal desire and an eternal intent to share His life with us forever, no matter what. We're talking about a God who can't keep anything good to Himself. Is that a gracious or merciful God or what? Now, we're not studying anything this morning. We're just listening for our Father's voice. I'm going to read this from that Father's voice perspective, so listen with your heart, alright? I am the Father of your Master, Jesus Christ, and I have taken you to the highest places of blessing in Him. Long before I laid down earth's foundations, we had you in mind, and we had settled on you as the focus of our love to make you whole and holy in our love. Long, long ago, we decided to adopt you into our family through the Son, Jesus Christ. And what pleasure we took in planning this. You need a little Selah right there, a little divine, wait a minute. What pleasure we took in planning this. We wanted you to enter into the celebration of our lavish gift giving by the hand of the beloved Son. And because of His sacrifice and His blood poured out on the altar of the cross, you are a free people, free of the penalties and punishments that were chalked up by all your misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. We thought of everything. We've provided for everything that you could possibly need. And we're even letting you in on the plans that we took such delight in making. We've set everything out before you in Jesus Christ. A long-range plan in which everything would be summed up together in Him. Everything in deepest heaven. Everything on planet earth. Because it is in Christ that you are going to find out who you are and what you're living for. Long before you first heard of Christ, and got your hopes up, we had our eye on you. We had designs on you for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose that we are working out in everything and everyone. It is in Him, in Christ, that you, once you've heard the truth and believed in Him, will find yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. Then if you go to the next chapter, you find these words. Then why would you let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live? <laughs> Listen, this is the intent of our Father. And what our Father intends, He acts upon. He doesn't just think about it. He doesn't keep it in an idea form. He comes to demonstrate, to actualize every intent that is, is in his heart. And in multi multiple passages, this one among many others, we see clearly that the ground of God's initiation, the ground of his covenant, is his own loving nature. For God so loved the world. You can't get any simpler than that, but you can't get any deeper than that. Because the love of God is a whole passion for oneness. He cannot abide separation. He moves in the direction of need so that out of His abundant and eternal fullness, He can meet whatever the need is. That means every one of God's covenants, every covenant that He initiates is a love affair, not a legal affair. The Old Testament was never a legal affair. Nobody was ever put right with God in the Old Covenant by law keeping. It was always about a love affair, about God's holy passion for oneness and His willingness to make provision for those who stood in need. Why is that so important? Because if you have been made and remade in the image of God, you are a lover. And lovers need no laws. I was in a conference with someone a few, week, a few a couple of years ago. And he was trying to talk about our freedom in Christ and maybe pushing it a little bit further, but he was just trying to make a point. He simply said, you know, you, you, don't, you know, you don't have to obey any stop signs out there. You're free from the law. I thought, oh, I don't know that I'd say it that way. <laughs> and it was my turn to speak. 
Lovers don't need stop signs. A lover would never go barreling through an intersection without looking first to make sure nobody else was going to get harmed. Our freedom is to be even as He. Our freedom is to be compelled by this holy passion for oneness that cannot abide separation, that doesn't need a law. This is what illustrates for us the aim and the goal of all God's covenant making. Because the aim and the goal of covenant is that two should function together as one. You were talking about dancing this morning. One lovingly leading, the other respectfully following, so in tune, so in step, that those two are moving together as as one. This is the oneness that Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17. That they may be one Father, even as we are one. We begin to see that this loving God who initiates this covenant arrangement with, with us finishes everything that He starts. Even the psalmist got this under an old covenant understanding in Psalm 138.8. He said, my God accomplishes everything concerning me. Does that take a load off or what? Paul said it in the New Covenant sense in Philippians 1.6 that everything God started, He finishes in His Son Jesus Christ. We find Him being what? The promise and the performer of everything about this covenant. He is the doer of everything that is accomplished for us. That means you and I must always dare to keep God as the subject and the center of all of our proclamation, of all of our teaching of all of our living. Anytime you are listening to someone and the subject or the center of what they are telling you is not God, you better have little red flags starting to wave all over the place. Because the truth of the gospel always has God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit at its core and at its center. You want to learn to diagram every one of your theological statements. And I know some of you were in the eighth grade going, oh, that brings back horrible memories. I hated diagramming sentences. And some some of you loved it, right? You just loved that part of school, man. You love to get those subjects and verbs in the right place. Listen, as a New Covenant theologian, you must always have God at the subject of all of your statements. Because covenant making is not about sin, it's not about law, it's not about you and me. It is about the divine initiative and the divine continuance of our Heavenly Father who has made for every single provision that we're ever going to need. Everything that He purposed before the foundation of the world, everything He created and put into motion in the first couple of chapters in Genesis, everything that was lost in the third chapter of Genesis, everything that was promised in the covenant around of Genesis 3.17 has been fulfilled and delivered by the Messiah of the new covenant. And God has made a covenant with His Son, not with you and me. He doesn't make a brand new covenant every time a believer puts faith in Jesus Christ. Whatever covenant arrangement He has with His Father becomes the arrangement we have with our Heavenly Father. Because in this covenant arrangement, Jesus becomes my relationship to everything. Yes, he does. What his relationship is to the Father is my relationship to the Father. What his relationship is to sin is my relationship to sin. That's why if he died to sin, we are dead to sin. Amen. Whatever his relationship is to the law is my relationship to the law. And if he has met the requirement of the law, and that is the end of righteousness for every believer who puts faith in Jesus Christ, I'm as finished with the law as Jesus is finished with the law. Whatever my, his relationship is to you is my relationship to you. It's not about your behavior. It's not about my preferences. It's not what I think or feel about you. It is his relationship to you and me. That's the power of knowing who we are and who He is in this arrangement. Stunning truth number two. This God has fully and freely provided a full and perfect salvation. The central fact of this new covenant arrangement is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not made one with God because God loves us. We are not forgiven because God loves us. That is to trample underfoot the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are forgiven, we are delivered, we are made right, we are who we are as new creations because of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
There is no bypassing the cross. Most of the gospel according to man is an attempt to bypass the business section to get on to the things that we think will benefit us on the other side. There is no bypassing the business section of the gospel. It is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul spoke of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember he was... Son, a crucified God, a Messiah who dies, who pours Himself out for undeserving, needy people. When He saw the cross, it represented everything, not just the crucifixion. It was the entire story of Jesus Christ. We don't want to miss on any of it, and we could talk about that for months, and I'm sure you talk about it in some way, shape, or form every week. Because you see, it's by the cross that the new covenant does what the old covenant could never do, make brand new creations. Just remember the headlines of the old covenant arrangement. It was an external arrangement between God and His people. There were external mediators. There were external priests. There were external laws. There were external sacrifices. Everything about it was external. What happens in the new covenant arrangement? It's all internal. It's all been personified by Christ. He is our law keeper. He is our mediator. He is our priest. He is our living sacrifice. He comes and literally undoes and does what the old covenant could never undo or do. And He brings it into your life and mine in such a full and perfect way that every one of us can say without embarrassment or apology, we are fully and perfectly saved. We have a full and perfect Savior. He's either fully and perfectly saved us or He's failed. The Old Covenant was about fellowship. There was a constant gap between God and His people. What do we read about in Jesus Christ? It's not about fellowship at all. It's about fellowship. There aren't gaps any longer. You don't get in and out of fellowship with God. It's one of the most predominant things I hear in the counseling room. We sit down to talk about the mess that maybe their life seems to be in. Why do you think you're in that mess? Well, I'm out of fellowship with God. Who told you that? Well, my preacher said, you know, I'm out of fellowship with God. Listen, did you get into fellowship with God by doing something good? Well, no. What makes you think doing something bad puts you out of fellowship with God? Is this about you and your performance? Because that is a hell of a place to be in a relationship with God. It is not about you and your performance. It is about Christ and His performance. Has He closed every gap? Has He filled every chasm? Has He bridged every separation or not? We are in fellowship with Him. We share a common life together. The Old Covenant made way for a penal sort of substitution. There was an impartation of forgiveness or an imputation of forgiveness. There was an imputation of those things, but no impartation. We have a personal sacrifice now in the Son of God who's taken up residence in us. And in this old covenant arrangement by which we still try to do, new covenant Christianity, there was always talk about the presence of God being mediated. The presence of God through the pillar of fire. The presence of God through a cloud or a burning bush or through the priests. After Pentecost, you will be hard-pressed to find any talk about the presence of God in your Bible. It is about the person of God, Jesus Christ. You have something way beyond a presence that is flitting here today and not there tomorrow. You have the very person of God who has said to every one of us in this room, I will never leave you or forsake you. Not ever, not once. That's why the writer to the Hebrews said, we have a much new and much better arrangement. We are already justified. It is an act that's finished. It's very personal. It's not just forensic. It's not just judicial. You have received the person of righteousness inside of your human spirits. Your justification is not about some new account you have in the heavenlies. It is the very life of Christ that's been given to you while you're still here on earth. This is an arrangement in which it's all been done by God. And that is such good news because if it was done by me, I'll bet it could be undone by me. How are you and I going to undo what God has done? A finished righteousness, more than Adam would have or boast of if he were still roaming around in the garden today. 
of finished righteousness in Jesus Christ. It is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that comes and kills an enemy and raises a friend. It slays a sinner and resurrects a righteous one, a saint. Why is it so important again for that understanding to take root? Because whatever can't justify you can't sanctify you. Whatever can't put you right with God can't keep you right with God. There's no separate process called justification and some supplemental or sequential thing called sanctification. That's a great way to play right into the devil's hands and get you to work on character development because if you're working on your character development, you can't have eyes for other people. And the life of God flows through us when our interest is one another, not ourselves. The justifier and the sanctifier has taken up residence in us. We'll never ever be any more justified or any more sanctified than we already are in Christ Jesus. How did that happen? We received the crucified risen life of Christ. Listen, the new covenant does not bring life out of the old. The new covenant brings life out of the death of the old. This crucified life was applied to you and me. The word of the cross says, let there be death. Let there be death to the you that was under the curse of the law. Let there be death to the sinful you. The sinner is never forgiven. The sinner isn't even saved. The sinner is terminated. Yeah. Listen, you were so bad off, God couldn't help you. <laughs> he had to kill you. He had to crucify us. God isn't helping us live the Christian life any more than He's going to help us get saved. He did not help us get saved. He delivered us. He crucified and buried a life that was terminal. Let there be death to the separated you. You died to the separated, cut-off life and all the death that went with us. Meaning what? You and I do not have to be law-conscious any longer. We don't have to be sin-conscious any longer. We don't have to be self-conscious any longer. And you can mark this down and take it to the bank. Self-consciousness is the primary enemy of all spiritual transformation. You thought it was sin, but it's not sin. There's a solution for sin. It is self-consciousness that keeps the life of the Son of God from flowing freely through you you and me. So anytime we gather to read our Bibles for the purpose of being conscious of ourselves or gather in meetings to work on and improve ourselves, we are blocking spiritual transformation. We're not sin conscious. We're not law conscious. We're not Satan conscious. We're not separation conscious any longer. We're not self conscious any longer. We are conscious of Christ and what He has done for us. This word of the resurrection is, let there be life. Yes, we have been justified by the blood of the Lamb. Praise God. We are saved by His life. Let there be a love-compelled life in you, not one oriented to a law any longer. Let there be a righteous, holy you. Let there be a God-indwelt you. Let there be, let there be, just like God said, let there be Isaac. And there was Isaac. By his say-so, not by Abraham and Sarah's doing, right? These things aren't made true of us by our doing. They're received freely or we do without. Yes. The primary distinctive of this whole new covenant arrangement is this indwelling God. It's the distinguishing mark of what it means to be a son or daughter of God. It's not our doctrine. It's not our exchange life theology. It's not our behavior. It is the indwelling Savior who is full and perfect in every way, who's fully and perfectly saved us. Now we're conscious of Him. We are conscious of who He is and how He wants to live His life through us. Third and final one for this morning. This is stunning. You can enter into and live by this life now. We're not waiting until we die. Paul speaks a lot about a, a double inness. A double inness. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. In Christ is the arena of action. Christ in us is now our determining reality. Remember just you died? Who's alive now? Christ in me. That's who's alive now. 
What does that mean? We have been given both the context and the contents for everything necessary to live life the way God intended. But be careful before you jump in and give it a weak hallelujah. Because that means you're responsible. There's nobody to blame. There's nobody to shift the responsibility to. We have been graced with the context and the contents to do life as God designed and intended. You see, for all of its mystery and spirituality, the new covenant arrangement is a very material spirituality. There's something very concrete and solid and substantial and real about it. It's to be embodied. It's to be given expression to. The failure to appreciate that reality and appropriate it necessarily is what makes so many of us so wispy and ethereal and insubstantial. So much so many of us can walk by motion detectors and the things don't even go off. There's just not enough substance in there. That wasn't true of the life of the Son of God in Jesus of Nazareth or in Paul or in any who dared to take God at His word. What did you receive then experientially? We received a righteous implanting. That ought to be gloriously good news to us because what that means is God puts into us everything that He wants out of us. We said it earlier, it's more than an imputation, isn't it, of forgiveness. More than an imputation of righteousness. The forgiver lives in us. The righteousness of God lives in us. We're not just celebrating a new account and something that's been deposited in our name in the books of heaven. We're talking about a very life that's been deposited into our human spirits right now here on this earth, on this planet. This eternal life that we received is not an extension screwed onto our lives so we live forever. This eternal life is God's life. That life without beginning, that life without end, that life that is inexhaustible. This kind of righteousness, this kind of life may be impossible. And of course it's impossible for us to generate. It's impossible for us to imitate. It's not impossible to receive. It is not impossible to live by. That's why when we say we're trying hard to make this work, you and I may have just given the ultimate affront to grace. Trying hard says, put me in the right set of circumstances, surround me with the right people, give me the right information, and I can make this work. No, we trust the only one who can live this life is the one who's been deposited in us. We've received His righteous implanting. We've also received from Him the relational empowering. So many verses that speak to this, I could spend forever on them. But let's just say it this way. The power of God is for His purposes. The power of God is for His purposes. So listen carefully to me. His purpose is not to make you successful in anything. That's a utilitarian view of God. God will be meaningful to me to the degree He's useful. And as long as my family prospers and my business prospers and my church grows, then God will be meaningful to me. His power is for His purposes. His purposes are not to make you and me successful in anything. We may end up successful in some ways by man's estimates, but we don't even know how to define the word, so we ought to stay away from that word. He's not designing to make us successful in anything by man's estimates. His power and His purpose is to make you and me sacrificial in everything. Now that's when even exchange life people want to get off the peace train. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus is in me, but that's going to make me successful, right? I don't know. I don't know. That's not my call. I got the impression from Jesus' conversation with James and John, it wasn't even his call. He said, that's not mine to give. That's my Father's determination. I'm not here to give you power and authority and success on any human level. How did God demonstrate who He was to us, according to Romans 5? He demonstrated His love for us through what? 
He didn't demonstrate it through some successful person who comes and builds all these successful entities and has all these multitudes of crowds following him everywhere that he goes. He came and demonstrated who he was through the sacrificial gift of his son Jesus Christ. You want this life we're talking about to flow, you quit looking for success. You start letting the sacrificial life of the Son of God find His expression as you. You'll have more life than you know what to do with. If it looks like success to the world, then thank God for it. I hope you have multiples of millions in the bank somewhere. But if it looks like you're sitting in a prison cell somewhere with not even a cloak to your name and none of the brothers and sisters in Rome have checked up on you so that when Onesiphorus comes to find you in Rome, he can't even find you? He has to look diligently for you because the whole church has forgotten who you are as the Apostle Paul? Don't you say for a minute that Paul wasn't successful in that moment. He was right where God intended him to be because the gospel of Jesus Christ through Paul is still being preached from that cell. There was nothing unsuccessful about it. There was nothing wasted about it. The sacrificial nature and message of the Son of God was coming through that moment. The power of Jesus Christ in you and me is always for His purposes. His purpose is to make you and me like Christ, the sacrificial one. You see, we have the willing and the working of God in us, according to Philippians 2.13, for this purpose. We've been given a corresponding supply of His life for every single directive or temptation. We share in the very nature of God, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1. We are complete in Christ, missing in no thing. It's one of the things we tell the students at our church at the University of Florida who come in often just kind of because they got to go to church for a class, you know, comparative religion or philosophy class. And they always ask the same question. What is it about Christianity that makes it distinctive from all the other major monotheistic religions? And, and I've got it nailed. I know what's coming. And you can give them all kinds of answers. But I usually give them this one. I take them to Colossians 2, 8, 9, and 10. We are complete in Christ. I said the goal of every other religion out there is to get to completion someday. In our faith, it is not the goal, it's the starting point. We start complete. Now, in life, if you confuse the destination with the beginning, you can really get messed up, right? We start complete. We have been graced with everything pertaining to life and godliness. That's our starting point. And we have been given a corresponding supply of the life of God for everything that God asks of us. It's already there. We don't forgive people and love people and turn the other cheek and go the second mile because these are the things that good Christians do. That's not why we do them. We do them because a forgiver lives in us, a lover lives in us, a second mile life lives in us, a guy who turns the other cheek lives inside of us. We do not return evil for evil. We do not hold grudges. We do not tell lies. We do not give in to lust. Why? Because good Christians don't do these things? Absolutely not. The life inside of us does not do these things. This is not who we are. This is being totally out of step with who we are. So I'll greet our church. I was telling Dave, 75% of them are under 25 and single in our church on the University of Florida campus. But many, many Sundays I'll greet them with, how is your righteous, holy, totally forgiven, deathless, perfectly loved self today? And they're going. They were not thinking that way, acting that way at 3 o'clock that morning. <laughs> But you're not your performance. You are what God says about you. And you have a corresponding supply of life for everything that He asks of us. See, that's why we want to speak to the new man. That's why we want to say to a brother who has been caught in an error, you're a truth teller, my brother. It's got to feel terrible to tell a lie. There's no liar living in you. You don't ignore or excuse the fact that someone has told you a bald-faced lie, but you don't condemn them or name them by their performance any longer. Or we might say to someone who's been hurt deeply and struggling with bitterness and resentfulness, look, there's a forgiver living in you. You're not ever going to be at home again living in bitterness. That's a choice if you want to. You don't have to feel like forgiving. What do you mean I don't have to feel like forgiving? I'd be hypocritical and God hates hypocrites. So that ought to work. Try that. In fact, you don't feel like going to work tomorrow, don't go. 
Just call your boss up and say, I don't feel like coming in, and that'd be hypocritical, so I'm going to stay home today. You don't do that in any other area of life. <laughs> Make you a good employee. You don't feel like getting up for the third time in the middle of the night with a sick child. Oh, I'm just going to lie here. God hates hypocrites. <laughs> you get up. Makes you a great mother. A wonderful father, by the way, guys. You know, you get up, get points with that. <laughs> Come on, we're just hiding behind excuses. We have a forgiver living in us. And if you don't know where else to start, you can say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who forgive, it's Christ who forgives in me. And the fool I now forgive, I forgive by the faith of the Son of God who loves that person and has given himself up for them. Because there is a corresponding supply of his life for every directive that he gives us. This is a life that is for others. You're never going to be at home living for yourself again. It just isn't going to work. It's not who you are any longer. We have been made new creations in Christ. This is our nature. This is the intent and the action of God. To the degree you find ourselves, we find ourselves out of step with the intent and the action of God, I promise you to that degree you'll find yourself frustrated and fatigued. You don't have any grace to live for yourself any longer. You can do it. There's no energy for that. To the degree you and I find ourselves in step as we're growing in the awareness of what it means with the intent and the action of God to love us into being and to let Him love others into being through us, to that degree we will find our fulfillment. We will find our meaningfulness in the midst of whatever the externals are. Why? Because greater is He who is in you than anything that is out there. Will you pray with me? I'm love with the greatest love But I know that I've been forgiven And I'm love with the greatest, with the love. greatest love Oh, I've been set free I've